Welcome to episode three of Hashbang TV. I'm Chris. And I'm James. On this week's show, we are going to talk about the format of the show. We're going to talk about BlackBerry DevCon. And then we have Tebow from WIP coming in for our interview slot. Uh, we're going to talk about Foursquare and their NFC check-ins plans. Yep. And we talk about our t-shirts as normal. Of course. So, feedback on the format of the show. Yeah, so uh, we've been getting a lot of good feedback, so thank you for that. Um, still people are a bit hung up about the, the, the play length of the episodes. So we're going to try something different for you because we listen, right? So we're going to try and keep this one as short and as punchy as possible. Uh, most of the content will be the interview with Tebow. Uh, uh, but if you want to hear more, then we'll have an extended version as the podcast, right? Yeah, so that's our plan. Mm -hmm. We're going to have two different lengths. People don't want to stay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, insert joke here. So the first thing we're going to talk about is um, BlackBerry DevCon. <laughs> Your elbow all right? Yeah, it's fine. Okay. Yes. So I spent uh, three days in Amsterdam at BlackBerry DevCon. Lots of interesting and engaged developers there. And so, that about 2,000 people. Yep, yeah, 2,000 developers, I think. Yeah, people that, uh, you know, that attended a, 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 as that. So, uh, yeah, it was, all, it was all very good. I think, again, the platform situation is they're all reliant on this BlackBerry 10 platform. So, you know, they're, they're laying that out as a the future. They're saying they're not supporting other things. Um, so they're taking things from, from, from old, old time sort of support and putting it into BlackBerry 10. Um, so when, when does BlackBerry 10 come? Well, they're talking about Q4 2012. So, oh, wow. Yeah, still a bit of time to go. Okay, um, so what do people do in the meantime? Then? Well, you, what can was use, the story? you can use WebWorks and, and that, will back, that will compile <coughs> down to earlier um, BlackBerry mobile platforms and, and they'll run on, on the playbook as well. Um, so, so, but it, but they're, they're, they're future platform and, and they're going to use Qt, yep. so the Qt development environment, um, so that people can develop using C++. Mm -hmm. um, they can use WebWorks and that all goes, and, they, and then that's going to run across all platforms. So it sounds like they've got the kind of, uh, the technical stuff kind of there, you know, there's a, there's a story, but, yep. you know, do they talk much about the kind of company itself and kind of provide any reassurance about uh, the future, you know, device sales are kind of going down a little bit. So as a developer, should mm. I, you know, did they give me any reassurance that I should invest in it? So, you know, my conclusion was that the whole thing was a very positive statement of intent. We wait for BlackBerry 10 to see what actually has happened with the technology and we wait to see what devices get launched, you know, and what their capabilities are and whether they actually hit the smartphone market you know, properly and, and, and have a resurgence. Okay. So, so it's, it's one, all good. One to keep an eye on there. Yeah. So some new news uh, this week is uh, NFC being added to Foursquare. Yeah. So now you can do physical check-in at uh, locations rather than having to open up the app, you know, search, check-in, blah, blah, blah. So, uh, you know, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, any, anything that makes that kind of service easier to use and you don't have to go and search out the app and check in, for, you know, manually is going gonna, is gonna to drive adoption, definitely. Yeah. Would like to know about Foursquare and how many of the users are on an iPhone platform versus any other platform, though, as a percentage. And, and uh, So that's the question, you know, how penetrated is NFC? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the, that's the, 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 the $64,000 question, right? It's kind of... <laughs> Who's on NFC? Yeah. You know, why are Foursquare kind of doing this so early on when I, I can't recall coming going into any venue that advertises that it's NFC enabled? But Foursquare itself, I've, I haven't used it. I've used it on and off over the last couple of years. Um, I started using it again a few weeks ago, logged in with Facebook, which was a much easier experience than the last time I used Foursquare. Um, but yeah, it's useful to see tips and stuff like that. But what about when it kind of spams that I get loads of people, oh, stop posting it to Twitter. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point because I think, you know, a lot of developers now are kind of writing applications to deliberately allow you to integrate and cross post with other social networks, which can be a really useful feature. And obviously from a marketing perspective, it's really good because it, you know, builds awareness of your service in other places. But the kind of user reaction to that is like you say, I've had about maybe half a dozen people tell me that if I didn't stop, you know, auto posting to Twitter for my Facebook <laughs> check-ins, they were going to stop following yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I had to go through and configure it all to stop cross-posting. Yeah. So that, I think that's a really interesting challenge for devs that are, they obviously want to build the profile of their service. They want to build, you know, um, cross-links between other social networks. But it's, it, it's that kind of avoiding the spam issue. That's something that's really, really important. Yeah, it's a new marketing skill, isn't it? Um, 
you want it to be viral, but you don't want it to be spammy. Mm. And, and getting that balance right, it was a bit like using somebody's contacts in a particularly clever way or not. Yeah. You know, that's the new skill about product development in this app space. And I think it's, it's about transparency. You know, you have to be really yes. clear about what yes. your app is doing. So the user knows up front. Yeah. And, and it's also about control. You know, so as long as you give the user the ability to untick stuff and yeah, it's not yeah, yeah. forced on you, then you're kind of heading in the right direction, yeah. I think. Right, we're joined by Thibaut Rafino from WIP. Welcome. Welcome to Hashbang TV. Thank you for having me. Ah, it's a pleasure. Um, so, how have you ended up where you've ended up? You've worked at Nortel, you've uh, worked for Symbian, um, and now you're... Uh, what's, the, what's the actual role of uh, what you do at WIP? I'm the European guy. Okay. So, taking care of everything that happens here in Europe. You've always been involved in technology, and yes. the role that you do at WIP is, is about developer advocacy, about recruiting kind of developers to this program, this partnership. What, explain a bit about what you do. So anyone coming in this space have to just like have a huge learning curve, uh, learning fast and learning a brand set of new people suddenly. And that's what we hope we, could, okay. we can help out with. So WIP's been around, what, three years? I mean... No, no, it's been around for like six, more than six years now. Six years? So oh, okay. I joined the company about three years ago, okay. um, put a bit of money in and... Uh, and uh, things have been doing well since, but the company has been in for six years. Actually, it's going to be our fourth party at Mobile World Congress of and course, probably yeah, like yeah, yeah. fifth or sixth year uh, with Jam. Yeah, wow. So, wow. so, so uh, how are things going? Is there more demand than ever for this stuff? Because I guess as more and more big companies wake up to kind of this whole developer thing, they don't know what it is, but they kind of feel like they need to get involved and figure it out. I guess there's more demand for you, you than ever, right? De definitely. I think the, uh, anyone and everyone has managed to spell open innovation uh, for an, in any type of companies. Uh, we see, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just at the back of, I've, so I've got that in my mind, like we're trying to organize in France a big uh, brand hackathon. So we ask all the top brands in the country to participate in a hackathon, bring all their open data and do like a big mashup. It was like, an uphill struggle put it this way uh, but it's like a lot of them are actually not willing to participate because they're already, already organizing their own hackathons yeah. oh, okay. and so like and it's and I'm not talking about tel tech companies or telco I'm talking about post office yeah. I'm talking about railways we just mentioned yeah. the um, there's a big French bank uh, Credit Agricole, and they just open they're in a plan right now to open all their uh, customer data to actually get developers to do application to help anyone and everyone who is a credit card customer, wow. like put money from one account to the other. And, and basically they're doing this kind of like credit card app store where people are going to be able to put the app that are built on this uh, and make money out of it as well. So you can see that this kind of stuff coming from companies like two, three years ago, you wouldn't have expected it. Yeah. And, and therefore, we, we just call left, front, right and center to do cool stuff. No. So, so what's your opinion on that? Because I, I can see both a positive and a negative of that, right? So I guess the positive is, you know, you guys have been out there for six years evangelizing the need to do this. So now you're seeing companies actually embracing that and doing more with the developer mm -hmm. community. But the flip side, which is something we see a lot, is there's just so much going on now. There's a real scarcity of quality events and developers are kind of just obliterated by all the different events they can go to it's hard to cut through um there's too much choice you know so uh, you know how do you see this playing out i um well that's one of the reasons why i was trying to do this big hackathon for all the brands and trying to tell them hey guys if you all organize your own thing like a the level of quality you're going to have is going to be pretty low because we know that things come from mashing up different stuff yeah. uh, i mean i guess you, you were sponsoring uh, with uh, bluevia uh, the music hack days yeah. uh, and the whole thing that's fun about music hack days is like all these providers of information and people just like adding them on top of one another if these big brands don't think this way i think it's it's going to take a while for something really cool coming out of it right now they're pouring a bit of money out uh, on it um so they, they're kind of happy, but I think that that's not sustainable in the long run. So I do believe in uh, in kind of bigger people getting together and then doing kind of themed event a, a lot more. Yeah, I mean, I think events are great because obviously to build a successful community, it's all about face-to-face -face interaction, right? And building those relationships. Yeah. You can't just do that on Twitter all the time. Um, but, you know, cutting right to the core of the issue then, do, do you think hackathons have got a future? Because I think, you know, it's an interesting topic to debate because there's so many of them, you kind of, 
the quality is dipping, I think. And also, I think a lot of sponsors that get involved in hackathons come in with the wrong expectation. You know, they think they're going to leave after a weekend with like, you know, half a dozen working products that's going to really drive their business forward. The reality is actually somewhat different, right? You know, quite often you've only got the, the, the kind of skeleton of an idea that really isn't suitable for commercialization. Or the more common problem is, you know, development teams come up with a great idea, but then, you know, on Monday morning, they go back to their day job and they don't have Mm -hmm. the time to actually then develop. So, you know, do you think hackathons are going to kind of implode um, or do you you actually think they've got a valuable contribution to make going forward? I I think hackathon could be used in completely different ways by by companies. Uh, And for example, imagine I'm a big brand trying to find developers to do an app for me. Right. Rather than going through like a deep circumvoluted process of asking an agency who are then going to recruit someone because they know him and so on and so forth, why don't you just create a hackathon with good prizes and one of the big prizes being to work with you afterwards? I think if you, if you manage the expectation and then if you just offer something which is like, you know, people put their time in. I mean, if you think about some of the developers who worked in this hackathon, some of them normally charge 800 pounds a day. Yeah. Like 800 pounds a day time, let's say 100 developers, like you have worth... Uh, that's eighty thousand pounds created that day. So that's the money they put in, and I think brands or whoever sponsors a hackathon should just recognize that yeah. and say, okay, there's been an investment on this side. This is the investment on my side, and let's try to to make it an an equivalent thing. At the moment, as you say, it's more, hey, give me your goodwill. Uh, events still play a really really vital part. You know, I know a lot of people are doing a lot of online engagement. You know, the kind of um, You know, Google are doing this thing, joining lots of developers together next month, you know, online at the same time, using Hangouts, things like that. That's all great. That will happen more and more. But there's nothing like sat across the table from somebody. That's really important. So they are, they still exist. I totally agree that the the experimental experience element is is crucial. And I think this is where, as an event organizer, we believe that... uh, we, this is where we want to make a difference. So, so you, Whip's been around six years, you've been at the heart of that for about three years. So you must have come into contact with hundreds of different startups, different apps. Is there any one that kind of stands out for you that's really kind of broken through? Because we talked a little bit in the last episode about this kind of Apple paying out $4 billion to developers through mm-hmm. the app stores. Chris kind of, you know, Chris's view was very few of that uh, very few of, of that money actually goes to these kind of, you know, small kind of startups. A lot of it is to games publishers and all those guys. So, you know, have you seen someone that's come from the kind of community and broken through and done that really well? I would say, I mean, the, the on the Android side in London, if you take a look at SwiftKey, I think they're, yeah. they're quite an interesting company. If that that what really, do they do? They do the most, I would say, used Android keyboard uh, oh, okay. um, on the planet, and they've, they've been like top selling for uh, over Christmas period, and so uh, so I think that they are one of them. And I think what I quite like about them is the fact that they completely they they're a new generation mobile startup versus the old generation. So the well, two generations. The old generation was about I need to have as many contacts with OEMs yeah. and operators, and my only channel to market is to go through these guys. Yeah. Like trying to go B two C to in the end go to these guys is just suicide. Uh, so I'm going to spend my entire first sale to these uh, these two uh, entities or types of entities. Uh, but these guys just like looked at this at this space, like bang their head on on the wall a couple of times and say, Hey, you know what? Screw you. Uh, I'm just going to go big time B two C. And they were extremely successful with that move. Mm. Um, I mean, people know Swipe quite a lot because they've been out for, yeah. uh, like outside for, for quite a bit. But I would say outside of the probably younger people, like most of them would know SwiftKey and not necessarily Swipe. So, so what was the secret to their success? Was it just first mover advantage that they were the first people to go for that? Or was there some amazing kind of marketing strategy that drove that awareness? You, have you got any insight in terms of what, what you know, what if people are watching this and sitting there going, I'd love to go B2C, but I've got no marketing budget. I, I don't know the mm-hmm. right people. You know, how, how can they break through? I think uh, well, we interviewed quite a few times, Joe, the uh, the, Mark, the uh, CMO of uh, SwiftKey, and, and they did a very good job working on the community. Right. Like they like very early taking beta customers and, and getting them on board, getting them excited about the product. And then those people became the evangelist. So it's been, it's been really like a, a community sell. 
Um, but that's interesting because right there you said they've got a CMO. I think a lot of startups don't have anyone in the organisation that's kind of focused on a marketing role, right? They're all kind of coders, engineers, technology guys. That's or or sometimes the CMO is it's I would say the what what's fun about Joe is like he's a CMO, he's a salesperson, he's a press person as well. And, and but you need this element. So I see a lot of people in in marketing roles forgetting that they have to be salespeople. If you're in a startup, you can't just be a marketing person. So just to wrap up then, why should people get involved in WIP? Um, just to have a bit of fun, first of all, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, and then I think we're constantly on the outlook for new opportunities for developers. So whether it's uh, new people who are getting involved in the mobile space and want to meet new developers, want to understand a bit more, that's we, we put them in touch. Uh, whether it's new types of events, so we're just organizing with London Book Fair on the 15th, 16th of April, uh, an app zone where the goal is to get people who write apps uh, for books, magazines, and so on and so forth to meet publishers with a lot of content. Yeah. Uh, and we want to do more of this stuff, so stay tuned. So we're coming to the end of episode three of Hashbang TV. It's been another glorious show. Just, we keep churning them out. We ch- <laughs> it's just gold. Churning. Churning. That's what a lovely churning. word. What a lovely yeah. word. And we always talk about our, our teachers, and I can see we've actually put the effort to put one in yeah, yeah, this I week. Th- which last, is Yeah, last week was a bit of a, I dropped the ball a little bit. Yeah. So I'm back. I'm back with a t-shirt. Yeah. In fact, I'm going to a gig this month just to buy a t-shirt. Really? So I've got something to wear on the show. Don't they sell them on the interwebs? Yeah, but I'm not like you. I go uh, to the shows uh, and I support see. the bands. You know? Okay. So what's this? The missionary position? Yeah, the mission. Yeah, yeah. So another goth, you know, band. Right. Um, yeah. British? American? British, yeah. From Leeds. Leeds. Yeah. Remember the Sisters of Mercy t-shirt I was wearing? Vaguely. So two of the, two of the members of the Sisters of Mercy are in the mission. Oh, jo- right. Join the mission when the sisters split up the first time around. So mine is an Oasis t-shirt yeah. from 2005. Uh, so you took the mick out of me last time. Uh, I was wearing a Radiohead con- uh, concert T-shirt that I didn't, um, uh, I didn't attend. Drunk but, shopping. Uh, yeah, and uh, so this one I actually was at the uh, City of Manchester Stadium, but I didn't buy it. I bought it from the guys outside for a fiver. You know, as you're walking away. The tabs. Yeah. The bootleg stuff. Yeah, bootleg. Yeah, 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 yeah. So do you want to apologise to Liam and Noel, you know, for ripping them off? Uh, sorry, our kids. I'm sure they'd have done it. They would, because they're scallies, right? Yeah, they would have done that. That's, you know, it's hustling, isn't it? Hustle. Yeah. Right, Gary V. Like, crush it. Uber billionaires, aren't they now? Liam they are now, but no thanks to you, obviously. Well, you know, it's all part of the thing. I didn't, you know, wasn't you paid in a for the business. ticket, though, right? I did pay <laughs> for the ticket, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's it's something. Good. Yeah. So, we're done. We're done. So, cool. hopefully, you like the new shorter format. Yep. If you want to hear more, unlikely, but if you want to hear more, <laughs> check out the podcast. Yep. Got some amazing uh, guests coming up yep. over the next few weeks. So we've got some really good people lined up to interview. Well, Timo was brilliant today. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, it was good. Good one. So this time, next time. Cheesy high five. Cheesy high five. <laughs> next time. <laughs> good. <laughs>